Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is truth and life to us. It is nourishment and nurture. Lord, we thank you that your spirit speaks to us as your church through your word. Help us, Lord, to heed it and obey it, to act upon it, to do it, Lord, to live it, that we might be your people in these days in which we live. For your glory we pray. Amen. 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 Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. The separated man. Separation. Separation. I know I've spoken of it lately as I do at times. Separation, a very important Bible doctrine. And the separated man is a blessed man. In Psalms, we read here of the call to separation, of the commendation of separation, and of the blessing of separation. We see here separation in that contrast that's pictured here between the blessed man and the ungodly. And separation we could see, as I'll put it in this message, in a couple of different ways. A separation from and a separation unto. A separation from deception, doctrinal error and defilement and a separation unto heart purity, holiness, and honouring God. So firstly we see a separation from, a separation from the danger of deception. Now, deception is something that can happen incrementally. It's got a creeping nature to it. Who's seen those, um, there's been some adverts about creeps on the road, hasn't there? Have people seen that? Where you tend to creep with your speed limit. It just creeps and creeps until you're going quite a bit faster than the speed limit. And deception is like that. It's incremental. It's got a creeping nature to it. And some are like that with sin. They first start dabbling with sin, toying with it, and end up getting in big strife with it. We see how in this text it tells us of the gradual working of this sin in the life of the ungodly, where they are walking in the counsel of the ungodly. So they're kind of walking alongside and listening to them. And then they're standing together with the ungodly, where they then end up sitting with the ungodly crowd and joining in with the world just like everybody else and joining in the scoffing crowd. And it shows here in this gradual step-by-step -step slip sliding that declining and creeping nature of compromise, of the danger of deception. And we can all succumb to that, that kind of subtle, steady, but deadly attraction away from the Lord. I think of loved ones that I know of, where they've kind of had this liking, for example, for rock music, and it's kind of drawn them away, drawn them away, and as it just gets a grip on them of that worldly kind of thinking, that worldly kind of style, that worldly kind of acting, and then you see that, that the lyrics of some of these songs as they're uh, full of cursing and, uh, and vile things. And when people get that little bit of a liking for something that's doubtful, it can lead to something that's totally dangerous and destructive. And I urge you young people, especially in that regard, that you question uh, such things and steer away from that which is doubtful. Steer away from it what is doubtful. You know, some might have a different stand of conscience from me on these matters, but I would just urge you, I think it's better to veer on the side of 
Steering away from what is doubtful. It's uh, the best course of action to take. From my experience with loved ones that I know of, that have just gone hook, line and sinker because it just, it drags people that way. Bit by bit they excuse it, they allow it, they condone it, they kind of think, oh, it's only a little bit worldly, but then it just drags them like a magnet away from the, that which is right. And so I would just urge you to be cautious and try not to set the bar too low on such things that you end up just swallowing it. Um, sadly, people accept things and then it gradually gets a hold of them. Because worldliness happens by degrees, by degrees, by increasing degrees. You know, I think back, I know I've had discussions with some of you here today, and I was looking back, Julie and I were looking back at some uh, footage of uh, some fellowships that we used to attend 30 years ago. And some of those people uh, are, uh, are with us today in this fellowship. Um, and I wouldn't have a bar with that kind of fellowship that I was in at that time. But even as they were back then, they weren't as worldly as I would consider them to be now. Mm. Uh, it's like it was a different kind of mindset that there was this caution about the world and the things of the world in, in these churches that you know, were trying their best to, to hold the line, but they've declined so rapidly. And I know of late I was hearing uh, of a, a local church where now they have hip-hop classes. Now, you wonder, well, I mean, I don't know what your stand of conscience is on such things as hip-hop. Uh, maybe your stand of conscience is different from mine. But if you want to learn hip-hop, surely it shouldn't be in the Church of the Living God. It should be down at the local disco or the pub or the local bar or, or the local nightclub. But why are they having hip-hop classes in the Church of the Living God? You know, you wonder how far will it slide? How far will it go astray? There's a declining, there's this steady slip sliding and, and such things that happens by degrees. Backsliding happens by degrees. Worldliness happens by degrees. And declining church attendance and faithfulness is like this too. Bit by bit by bit. We just tolerate, we excuse it, we justify it until we accept it and we become more comfortable with it. And then we become just like the world. So, I mean, if people want such things as that, then the world can give you such things as that. Uh, we as the Church of God uh, shouldn't have to bring in uh, such um, entertainment, uh, such worldly uh, techniques. And we know, I've seen footage of, um, of churches where uh, they have the Harlem Shake, for example, which is a totally uh, obscene... Uh, dance uh, craze and it's coming into the church of the living God you know why are, the, why are Christians swallowing this garbage why are they doing this why are they uh, taking these measures and then I saw this other footage of um, Mark Driscoll's church in America he's another big name that's out there and uh, one of the gimmicks that he uses is he has beer brewing classes for the men of his church he, he has he teaches his men how to brew their own home-brewed beer so that then they can go home and get drunk. This is the church. This is what's happening in churches, in churches today. And, and Christians are swallowing this dangerous, dangerous thing. And uh, they tolerate it, then they justify it, then they're just as, as vile and wicked as the world around us. There's no difference here. And people are ending up deceived as they're held captive by this subtle grip, this power, this, this powerful uh, compromise. They're sucked in, as it were, by this ungodly counsel, uh, ungodly associations, and end up with full-on godlessness. So that these youth groups are nothing more than discos with some Christian phraseology to the songs they sing. And so they're sitting together in alliance, in agreement with it, and they're full of the spirit of the world. Now, friends, today I want to urge you that God calls us to discrimination. Now, let me explain. Of course, we're, we're totally against racial discrimination and such things as that. But there is a godly discrimination because, because God calls us to discriminate. It's got the sense of to make a clear distinction. 
God makes a clear discrimination here between blessed is the man and the ungodly. There's a discrimination there. There's a difference there. There is a distinction there between the clean and the unclean. Of course, we as God's people, we know brothers and sisters, red and yellow, black and white. We're all God's people here today. And there's no discrimination of such a nature here. But there is a godly discrimination between what is clean and what is unclean. We read of that in Leviticus 10 verse 10. There's a difference between the holy and the unholy. Between the unclean and the clean. Friends, we're urged and exhorted in God's word to exercise discernment. To discern deception and detect it and reject it. Our world is gripped in the power of the evil one. 1 John 5, 19, it says the whole world is in the evil one's power. And John 15, verse 19, the Lord Jesus says, I chose you out of this world. We cannot have a compromising connection with the spirit of this world. We cannot mix the world and God's spirit together. We are not part of this world. We are passing through. Of course, we're to reach this world. As the Lord Jesus mingled with sinners, he wasn't afraid to mix with the sinful, but yet he was holy, undefiled and separate from the sinners. Hebrews 7.26 He was the friend of sinners, yet he was separate in that he wasn't um, party to their sin. And God calls us too, brothers and sisters, to be in the world, but not of the world. Not of the world. He doesn't want us to be bigots and hypocrites where we're holier than thou. But he does call us to be distinct, different, set apart, his devoted people. And Paul urges us in 1 Thessalonians 5, abstain. In other words, have a, a barge pole between all appearance of evil. Abstain from it. Keep clear of it. Even the hint of it. The appearance of it. So watch out for the creeping danger of deception. Watch yourself. Watch your church fellowship. Watch, watch your preacher. And watch that deception doesn't come in. Watch it carefully. We need to guard the truth and not remove the ancient landmarks. There's a sense where we've got to be sticking the marks, as it were, in a sense where we're like a tree planted in that uh, vicinity to that river. We want to be standing firm, not, gaining, uh, not letting the devil gain a foothold, not giving the opportunity to the flesh, not even starting on that slippery downward path that the world would tempt us with. That we will not dabble, we will not mess with it. We don't get our counsel from the world. In Psalm 119, David says, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. That's black and white, isn't it? I, I esteem all thy precepts, and I hate every false way. There's a, a real contrast there. And so, if there's something that has potential to harm your Christian life, if there's something that's got a potential to damage your devotion to Christ, to steal your energies away from Him, then steer away from it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Steer well clear of it and give it a wide berth. So be wary of deception. And that can mean in associations and in actions. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So we neglect separation at our peril. Guard yourself from that mixing, that compromising with the world and avoid it at all costs. So the separated man and woman will be alert to the danger of deception. Secondly, the danger of doctrinal error. Doctrinal error. In these last days, we're told there will be a great falling away. We're told this many times. The Lord Jesus spoke of false prophets, of false teachers, of abounding iniquity, of a spirit of deception. And I'm not saying holus bolus, but I'm saying I caution against numbers of the TV preachers that are popular, that much of their messages are wishy-washy, if not 
outright error, where they're not addressing truth, they're getting astray from, from sound teaching, and it's all very warm and fluffy and, and fuzzy in this kind of doctrine, this kind of teaching that is prevalent. Um, that's not to say we've got to watch ourselves too. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying we need to be alert to doctrinal error. It says in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6, A little leaven, just a little, leavens the whole lump. Speaking, uh, leaven speaks of sin and speaking elsewhere of false doctrine. And God warns us of doctrinal error. Doctrinal error. You know, our teaching must line up with God's Word. That's why we like to put an emphasis on teaching in this church. With our Sunday school, it's not just um, bedtime stories. It's not just Bible stories. There's doctrine to that teaching. There's doctrine there for the very young to learn the Bible, to learn about sound teaching so that they can know the truth and they can know error and discern it. And likewise, we have this Wednesday night fellowship we're going to be teaching sound doctrine. It's important for us. It's valuable and it's important in these days that we are alert to doctrinal error and no doctrinal truth. So we must guard our teaching. We prayerfully do guard our teaching. And correct me if you see my teaching astray because we want to know God's truth. We want our teaching to be biblical teaching and not doctrines of demons. Uh, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. We need to have our eyes open to recognise the dangers, to discern God's word, and that what we teach is wholesome doctrine, as we read in 1 Timothy 6 verse 3. And it's not perverting the gospel, but it's proclaiming the gospel. And so like the church at Corinth, much of the church today is full of disunity, carnality, Worldliness, doctrinal error. There's an abuse of spiritual gifts where they're just going totally, running totally amok in some circles where you go to a church and the message is scarcely a word from the Bible. It's all about visitations to heaven and angels and, and what, uh, what some preacher thinks God's told him to say, thus saith the Lord, but it's not quoting from this. And it's dangerous when we get... Uh, in, that, in that domain where we're getting astray from biblical teaching. We want to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. And so wrong teaching can be very dangerous for us and harmful for our Christian lives. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We must reject error and rebuke false teachers and contend. It's got a sense of a struggle, of a fight, of a combat for God's truth and to hold it fast no matter what, at all costs, because his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. As we know God's word, as we love it, as we meditate on it, as we put it into our hearts, it will help us to discern truth from error and the holy from the unholy. So there's a wonderful appeal of counteracting the danger of unsound doctrine, of doctrinal error, and having doctrinal truth. And thirdly, we should be alert to the danger of defilement. Now in 2 Corinthians 6, um, God says in that familiar one, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Don't even touch it. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There's a wonderful separation unto God, and, and away from defilement. It goes on, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now God wants his people to be clean and cleansed from all defilement. Now the Bible speaks of being unspotted from the world. If you hang around a, um, a splashing bucket of mud long enough, 
you're going to get spots on your clothing, right? Don't even hang around it. We want to be unspotted from it. We don't even want to splash a speck of it. Uh, we don't want to have any question. We want to be cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And so in the Bible there's this clear dividing line between righteousness and unrighteousness, between light and darkness, between Christ and Satan, between faith and infidelity, between the temple of God and the temple of idols. And God wants us, as his people, to not be defiled, but to be cleansed. Friends, sin will break fellowship with God. In Psalm 66, the Lord says, if I, well, David says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And friends, if there's that defilement, it can break that communion with God. It can break that fellowship with Him. When there's unconfessed sin in our lives, let's identify it. Confess it, as we heard this morning. Avoid it. Flee from it. Cleanse ourselves from all defilement of uh, flesh and spirit. And be separated. In Psalm 1 verse 4 it says, The ungodly are not so. As far as they're not planted firmly like the tree, but they're like the chaff that's wind driven around by the wind, that the wind driveth away. The separated man, then the separated woman, will be alert to being separated from some things. Just to recap thus far, the danger of deception. Be not deceived. The Lord Jesus says it's, a, it's really a key verse for the days in which we live, isn't it? Be not deceived. The danger of deception, the danger of doctrinal error, and the danger of defilement. It all comes when we start to listen to the counsel of the ungodly. We end up sitting in the seat of the scornful. One thing leads to another. The separated man and separated woman <coughs> will heed God's call to be separated unto God. So let's look at some other things now. How we'll be separated unto some things. We've looked at the negative side. We've looked at that which we should be separated from. Deception, doctrinal error and defilement. Let's look at now the things as God's people that we are called to be separated unto. These are the good things. The things that we should be dedicated unto. So our resolve is to leave those things and to be dedicated unto these things. So Psalm 1 verse 2 it says, But his delight, the delight of the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Firstly, we see the call to heart purity. Heart purity. We see, as against defilement, we're called to heart purity. In James 1.27, it tells us of pure religion and undefiled before God. And the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We're called to a heart purity. God wants us to have a clean heart. And there is a delight. There's a delight in the heart of the blessed people of God. There's a delight because we, our delight is in God's Word. Our delight is there. There's a washing of the Word. In Ephesians 5, we read how the Lord Jesus has wanted to sanctify and cleanse His church by the washing of water by the Word, that He may present it to Himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. There's something clean and fresh about this refreshing, this washing, this washing uh, of the word. There's a great feeling when we have a good wash, isn't there? There's a great feeling, a great refreshing to feel clean. And there's that wonderful cleansing that can happen in the spiritual vein too. That purity, that undefilement, that heart purity that can come. And it's beyond skin deep. It's a heart purity, where our delight, it comes from the innermost person. Our delight is from that heart made clean by faith. That heart that is made his own heart, uh, that new heart. And it's a clean heart, it's a new heart. A heart inclined after his spirit. And so we're called to have that heart purity. Not that mixture that we warned against in Leviticus 19, Verse 19, God warned against Israel against mixture, mixing things. They went to sow with mixed grain. They went to wear mixed garments. 
They weren't to mix the species of their cattle. Of course, we can think, well, it's got nothing to do with us today, such laws as that. But the point was being made, God was against mixture. And God is against mixture. You can think, if I was to hold here a, a, a glass of water and to pour some oil in it and shake it all about, it might look cloudy for a moment, but eventually the oil would separate from the water. And there would be a clear distinction, a clear object lesson for us as to the separation. They, they really are different substances, and so they will not mix. And God wants that with his people. He wants us to be a pure church. A church not with a dangerous mixture, as a kind of hodgepodge mishmash of truth and error, of the world and the spirit. They shouldn't mix. They're different. They're, there should not be this kind of, kind of mishmash where you come to a church and it sounds and smells and feels like a rock concert and as to the environment of it, as to the, uh, the intention of it. It's just like that kind of atmosphere that you could get from uh, such a place, a nightclub or a disco and such things as that. I think it's a very sad thing. I think there's a lot of well-meaning kind-hearted people that are swallowing this kind of thing and think there's nothing wrong with it. Whereas, I just can't get my head around it. It does my head in to see such a thing going on. Because I can see how God's Word is very clear. He wants that separation. He wants that these substances don't mix. The world doesn't mix with the Spirit of God. It's not, they're, they're different substances. They're different intentions there. And so he called to be undiluted, uncontaminated, uncompromising, a separated people where there's a heart purity. And again, I'm not trying to project this idea that we've all got to walk around uh, as some kind of glum-faced and, and grimacing, uh, you know, sour kind of looking people. But there is that sense where the world shouldn't mix with God's people. We shouldn't have that contamination. So there's a call to heart purity. There's a call to holiness. Why should we be separate? Because God commands us to be separate. He commands us. He commands us to that beauty of holiness. There's a beauty to it. It's not an ugly thing. It's not, a, it's not an unpleasant thing. There's a beauty to holiness. There's something beautiful to see a young woman, a young man who dedicates themselves to purity before marriage. There's something beautiful about a, a man or a woman who says, I'm going to stand for God and even though people laugh and mock and scorn me, uh, I'm going to stand for God in my workplace and I'm going to be a Christian who stands up for what I believe in, uh, no matter what the cost uh, to me. You know, it might cost you promotion. It has me. It might cost you in lots of ways, in lots of opportunities of life. But what, does, what really matters is what's, what's right. And so being holy has a beauty to it. It's got that sense of you belong to God. You're, you're meant to be part of that glorious, that spotless, that without wrinkle kind of church of God that he's coming back to like a, a, a pure bride. That's the kind of picture and it's something beautiful to see such a thing. That beauty of it, of belonging to God. Uh, that we are holy people. Just as we have a holy Bible and we're going to a holy city. There's something beautiful about that. There's something precious about that. Something that marks that as belonging to God. A holy people, obedient to God. In Romans 6 verse 22, there's a fruit to holiness. There's a beauty to holiness and there's a fruit to holiness. There's something that is vibrant and alive and it's living and, and abundant. As we see the picture of Psalm 1, uh, the, the, the leaf shall not wither and uh, they're going to bring forth fruit in the season. And so we see there's a fruit for holiness. You know, isn't it beautiful when you've got a fruit tree in your backyard and you see the fruit? And you can pick that fruit and you think, wow, that's just so beautiful. There's something beautiful about that. There's something wonderful about the fruit of that. And a Christian is meant to be fruitful, abounding as a green leaf, as, as that uh, sense of, of that fruit bringing forth. And the enemy doesn't want you to be a fruitful Christian. The enemy doesn't want you to bear fruit. He wants you to be a sterile, stagnant, 
Christian, a fruitless Christian. Uh, and he wants to spoil your fruit. He wants to put the um, worms in it and the fruit fly on it and corrupt your fruit and make it spoil. But God wants you to have that fruit of holiness. It's something beautiful. It's something good. And we're called to that. Holiness isn't something that's um, um, that, that puts us off, but it's something that attracts us. It's something that is very precious. When you see someone who's a glowing Christian, uh, it just draws you to them. and it, it, it makes you love them as a brother, as a sister. There's something precious and wonderful about that. That inward holiness that reflects in the life. So he called to a holy life, a holy living. Just as Abraham, he was called out of his country, that pagan land, and, and he was made part of God's nation, of God's people. And Hebrews 13 says, let us go outside the camp. There's a sense where there's a cutting off and there's a connecting to. The Lord urges us, come out of her. Speaking of religious Babylon, come out of her, my people. And be not partakers of our sins, but you receive not her plagues. In Revelation 18, there's that sense in the latter days where there will be this Babylonian kind of system that's just endemic and uh, just overwhelming, as it were, this, this latter day kind of churchianity that's going to be just basically following the Pope and his crowd and just kowtowing to all kinds of religious error. And so there's a needful sense where we need to be alert to such things and be aware of such things. So friends, separation is a vital Bible truth. Um, I'm, I understand this word relates to our word horizon. Horizon. Uh, where there's a separation, the light from the darkness, you know, the earth from the sky. Uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's a pretty clear cut kind of thing. When you see a horizon, you're either on the earth or you're not on the earth. There's a separation. That's the sense of, of separation, this vital Bible truth that we're either in Christ or not in Christ. We're in the world or in, in God's domain. And friends, I urge you today to think very carefully about where you stand today. Because we're meant to be those dwellers, those pilgrims heading to that heavenly city that is to come. And so we don't dwell here. We don't make our, our abode here. This is not our dwelling place where we belong. We're just passing by. Amen. And so we're meant to be that people who have that love for the things above, not the things on this earth. So we call to a separation from, from sin and unto God. A separation that's twofold. It's a boundary, a dividing. As God divides the world. Uh, he, he divides us from the world. And in a sense, he sets walls around his people. You know, there's a, a sense like Jerusalem um, was at risk when the walls were crumbling. When the walls were uh, faulty, Jerusalem was at risk. And when Jerusalem had its walls built, there was a strength there. There was a strength, a protection. There was a peace there from its enemies. And the enemy wants to break down the walls. Break down the walls. And we, we, we must not let him. Don't let him break down the walls. You know, I know some have got this idea, we, you know, we can be too, uh, too strict. I'm not saying any of that here today in this message. But there is that strength. That comes. We don't want to, we don't want to diminish the strength uh, which comes from trusting in God and that picture of the walls around the around the city. We want to protect our people. We want to protect our our faith. We want to protect ourselves as as God's people, just as God wanted His holy city to be protected. We want to protect that wonderful separation, that beauty of separation which is a good thing and a godly thing. So we see separation. It means a, um, a call to heart purity, a call to holiness, and thirdly, a call to honour the Lord. Psalm 1 verse 6, it says, For the Lord knoweth the way of the, un of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. God knows his own people. He knows 
them that are his. And he's called them out. It's what church means. They're called out. Yeah. Called out ones. He's called us out to stand out from the ungodly. So that we don't have the same um, loves that the world has. You know, we, it's like they're, they're on a different wavelength. You know, when they're going on about the latest hot goss about the latest Hollywood rock star or film star. Where well, that's just totally their wavelength. That's what they tune into. What, what should we be tuning into, brothers and sisters? We're meant to be God's people. We're meant to be God's holy people. So, again, there's personal things here. I might be stepping on your toes, and this might be maybe, maybe you like a certain rock star or a certain film star. Maybe, maybe you love that kind of thing. Maybe you can do that in good conscience before God. And uh, you, you've got no crimes of conscience about that. I'm not condemning you today. But I'm just saying, what should we love? What should we love? What should we be attracted to? What should, be, should we be attached to? What should be our conversation? What should, what should occupy us? What should be our preoccupation? Shouldn't we be a holy people? God's own people. Shouldn't we be a people that head into a holy city? that love our Lord more than anything that this world can afford? Shouldn't it be that holy preoccupation that our thoughts dwell on things above, not on things on this earth? Our affection is not here on these things, but our affection is on what matters to God, what, what is pure and right and true. Friends, God wants you to be a rock-solid Christian, planted firmly like a tree, Psalm 1 verse 3, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. There's a wonderful fruitfulness and abounding. Now that may not be in material sense, but in that, that vibrancy of the spiritual life. That's what should matter. That's what should set us apart. That we stand out from the crowd. We don't blend in like some chameleon, and we just go with the flow and follow the crowd and the, the latest gimmicks and gadgets and fashions. But our love, our affection is something eternal and precious and beautiful and wonderful before God. And so there's a separation that honours God, that we honour God, that honouring Him is what matters to us more than any other thing. And our stand of conscience might be different from another brother or sister from me on all kinds of matters. But what will matter is we honour the Lord. We honour Him. We put Him first and foremost. Our loyalty, our obedience, our conversation is tuned into Him, into what matters to God. That we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. And we want to please God in those decisions of life, in the everyday practical decisions of life, in those things that we choose to love, in those things that we choose not to love, that will, will put honouring God as our first and foremost consideration and that will value what God values and will speak of what God speaks of and will set ourselves apart daily, will consecrate ourselves, will despise error and every false way and will avoid it and hate every false way. And we'll take the gospel with us to the world because we're meant to be as ambassadors. We're meant to be shining as lights in a dark place. Not, not just dimming our lights and hiding our light under a, a bushel, under a container so it cannot be seen, but setting that light on a hill that it will beam out far and wide to everyone in our circle of acquaintance. So we'll be glowing, shining, shouting ambassadors for this message that... Our loved ones need to hear. How will they hear unless we tell them? We're called to be in the world, but not of it. You know, you're supposed to have your boat in the water, not water in the boat. Sometimes we've got water in the boat. We need to get it out. It's not going to help us. If we've got water in our boat, we need to get it out. Maybe as a Christian, there's water in your boat, so to speak. I'm I'm using picturesque language here. There's things that get in our lives that are going to slow us down. They're not going to help us on that. As we're rowing that boat, it's just going to slow you down. There's some things you've got to throw overboard. 
And sometimes those worldly things that can come in, you know, you, you hear some churches do some things like smash TV sets or, or get their, uh, their worldly rock music and they burn it and stuff like that. You might have uh, different convictions on all of these kind of subjects. But it's up to you before God to think, is this pleasing God? What is in my life? What I'm preoccupied with it? Uh, is it something that is a, um, an appearance of evil? We've all got to answer that question for ourselves, don't we? And ask God. We don't have to go completely nuts like, you know, some people go nutty and then, then they uh, wax and wane. You know, let's just think carefully and reasonably and sensibly and, and almost go through a bit of, of a checklist for ourselves and think, well, I'm doing this or I'm following that. Is that pleasing God? Is it something that I need in my life? Can I do that and please God? Maybe there's different worldly things you can join in that you can be a witness in. We're not against that. You can be uh, active in a sport and be a witness on the sports field or down at, at the local hobby club or whatever it might be that you're engaged in. You might be doing some study that's not necessarily spiritual but it's going to help you uh, in, in your practical life. There's all of these decisions of life we've just got to come to grips with. But first and foremost, let it honour God. Honouring God is what matters and what counts first and foremost. And everything else should be dictated and, and evaluated in the light of that. So let's make a determined step today to be separated. Separated, to be as this blessed man. To be as that one who's not going to be swayed by different counsel or different the way of sinners about the seed of the scornful. We're not going to be swayed by that. Our delight is in the law of the Lord. We delight in His Word. We meditate in it. We're grounded like a tree firmly planted by those rivers that keep us fresh and fruitful and vibrant. Not as the ungodly that are blown around by the wind, by every wind. We want to be rock solid and firm, unshakable. So we want to consecrate ourselves, to reckon ourselves dead to sin, to self and to the world, and reckon ourselves alive to God, alive to God. Amen. The separated one will be alert, to be separate from the danger of deception. Watch out. Watch out for anything that will cause you deception. Whatever it be, well-meaning Christian TV evangelists, and preachers and teachers and false prophets, danger of deception. Don't swallow everything you hear from a pulpit. The danger of deception, the danger of doctrinal error. There's many doctrinal errors. They're all over the place. In, in independent Baptist churches, doctrinal errors. There's dangers of defilement. Where there's dangers when we excuse something. Oh, it's just a little bit sinful. Oh, there's just a little bit of swearing in that thing that I'm going to watch. There's just a little bit of nudity, just a little bit of uh, fornication. The danger of defilement. Give an inch and the devil will take a mile. Don't, don't open the door. Don't let it ajar. The danger of defilement. Does it please God? Or is it defiling me and my mind? Separated from, separated unto. Heart purity. Have that heart that delights in God, in God's truth. Delight in Him. Delight in His Word. Meditate on it. A heart purity. A holiness. Not a holier than thou, but a holiness that's vibrant, that's beautiful, that's precious, that's glorifying of God. A beautiful holiness. That's what God wants for you. The beauty of holiness. It's something beautiful and pure and precious. And honouring the Lord. Honouring the Lord. So that in those decisions of life, you ask the question, does this honour God or not? If it's questionable, it's like water in the boat. It's better that you, that you bail it out, lest it slow you down. Believers here tonight are talking about your walk with God. If you're not a Christian here tonight, this won't make much sense to you because... You haven't even started. But I urge you today, trust Jesus Christ for time and eternity. Trust Him. 
there's, there's an amazing transformation. You go from being counted amongst the ungodly to being one of the blessed. The blessed. This word blessed, it means happy. It means joyful. It means uh, there's a, a joy, a blessing. And there's no greater blessing that you can know than to know Jesus Christ. There's no greater blessing that can fill your life. There's no greater knowledge, no greater joy than to know Him, to know Him. And a transformation happens when you trust Him. Let us pray.